Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back the president of the American Academy of Nursing, Diana Mason. Welcome back. I now have the distinct privilege of introducing the President's Award recipient for 2015. The President's Award recognizes an individual who's made an extraordinary, lifelong contribution to improving the health of individuals, families, or communities. The award is the highest individual achievement award given by the Academy and is only awarded intermittently when someone has been identified as being truly appropriate for the honor. I am pleased to announce that this year's President's Award goes to Dr. Mary K. Wakefield. Mary, come up. to say a little bit about Mary. Mm. Sounds like a movie. It's a movie. <laughs> it's a good script. Dr. Wakefield's leadership and accomplishments epitomize the Academy's vision of transforming health policy and practice through nursing knowledge while proudly retaining her nursing identity. <laughs> of course. Dr. Wakefield has improved the health of individuals and whole populations at the state, national, and international levels through her dedication and skillful command of health policy and politics. Driven by her desire to influence health on a large scale, Mary Wakefield's decision to work on Capitol Hill changed the trajectory not only of her own career, but that of health policy in the United States. Using her position as Chief of Staff to U.S. Senators Kent Conrad and Quentin Burdick of North Dakota, Mary fought to address the often neglected challenges confronting health care in rural America, before, long before rural health became a fashionable term. Her desire to continually build upon her experience and apply her knowledge led her to serve in many capacities, including as professor and director of the Center for Health Policy Research and Ethics at George Mason University, as an on-site consultant to the World Health Organization's Global Program on AIDS in Geneva, Switzerland, and as a member of the Institute of Medicine, where she served on the committee that issued the landmark reports to Air is Human and Crossing the Quality Chasm, and served as co-chair and chair, respectively, of the committees that produced health professions education and quality through collaboration, healthcare in rural America. And the list goes on. Mary's service on the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, or MedPAC, and other national policy advisory bodies advanced efforts to reduce health disparities, build healthy communities, ensure a well-prepared healthcare workforce that understands interprofessional collaboration and overall improve the health of the nation. It was exactly this breadth of expertise and experience that made Mary so well suited to be named Administrator of Health Resources, of the Health Resources and Services Administration, otherwise known as HRSA, by President Barack Obama. In her position with HRSA, Mary was responsible for administering key parts of the Affordable Health Care Act and told us all to get our butts in gear and to help with that. Today, Dr. Wakefield proudly serves as Acting Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, the first nurse to serve in this position. Mary, thank you for all that you do for the nation and for carrying your nurse background in the forefront. It's my distinct honor and pleasure to give you the President's Award. Thank you. Come over here for a photo.
I'd like that. I'm gonna yeah, give it to yes, yes, I'm gonna She's give walking it to away with my <laughs> award. <laughs> Anything else? Like no. <laughs> I'll be happy to take the mic, but only for a second. Diana, thank you so much, uh, and to the Academy. Deepest thanks uh, to all of you for the award. I'm going to be speaking in just a minute as your closing speaker, so I will take just one second to say that when you all come to the Hubert H. Humphrey building that's only a couple of miles from here, uh, the headquarters of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, when you all come there to visit me in my office, you'll see that award prominently displayed. And as such, I would say that that award will serve as a reminder, not just to me, but to everyone who comes there, uh, of what we as nurses do collectively. Not what I do individually, not what I've done, not what I hope to do, but what we do collectively. And it will serve as a reminder, not for the sole aim of advancing the nursing profession, but rather as a recognition of the contribution that the nursing profession makes to the health of this nation. So come visit me. Thank you for the award that will provide me that reminder every day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and take this seat here. You can't send me over there without my notes. Okay. Just let me see notes. All right. We will, we will let you go back now. She's very bossy as a leader of this organization. <laughs> I, you would not want me to ad lib for a half an hour. <laughs> I would say things. All right. All right, we won't go there. So thank you so much, Mary. And we are delighted and honored that you agreed to be our closing speaker before knowing you were getting this award. <laughs> Academy fellows and, and guests, I would please welcome the moderator for this session, Dr. Eileen Sullivan Marks, Academy board member and dean at the College of Nursing at New York University. Now, yes. Thank you. Just another a couple words about Eileen is that she also is one of our Academy Edge Runners. Uh, she, at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing, her former life, she headed up the LIFE program, Living Independent for Elders. That initiative is in the Affordable Care Act, the concept of that, and so that's extending the work of her and Jenny Hansen as Edge Runners. And she still co-chairs the Raise the Voice initiative. So I'm very grateful to the work that you do on behalf of the Academy and for the nation. So thank you. Thank you. All right. So I was enamored of that you moment. Oh, you were I'm enamored. Applauding you. <laughs> yes. Go right ahead. Thank you again, Diana. Uh, it really is an honor to be with you, all of you, this, uh, this afternoon, or this morning, uh, to be among a, a roughly 2,000 uh, members and fellows of the American Academy of Nursing. Uh, it's an honor to be a member of the organization and to be invited to speak at this annual conference. Uh, it's especially nice. It's just a privilege for me to be here among peers and friends. And to those of you who had to travel a great distance to be here uh, at this meeting, thank you uh, for taking the time and making that effort. The work that's discussed through the Academy is extremely important work. I do have some sympathy for those of you that had to travel, though, uh, because while I work in Washington, D.C., I actually live in North Dakota. That's my home. It's a long commute. It's an expensive commute. I don't make it as often as I would like, but I do appreciate the fact that many of you had to make an effort to get here, uh, to be here for the last couple of days. And again, such important work, so thank you for doing that. I want to recognize Eileen uh, as well uh, for the conversation that she and I will have shortly, and to say uh, that um, uh, without a doubt, uh, uh, Eileen has made incredibly important contributions, not just to nursing, but to healthcare broadly. And for that, uh, uh, and as a, mentor, as a role model for that, I thank her. I, I also want to, uh, thank, you. thank you, and I also want to acknowledge the Academy President, Diana Mason, uh, for her leadership. It, uh, she is one of uh, the, the incredible nurse leaders that we have uh, in the profession, and I am especially appreciative, not just of her leadership, but of her energy, her commitment uh, to driving uh, nursing forward, uh, and it's using its knowledge to inform health policy, and just for her, the simple talent that she brings uh, to the work that she does. I, uh, so to you, Diana. 
And I have to say that I particularly enjoyed a, one of those simple statements, uh, simple but powerful statements, that uh, Diana had made just last year on the other side of town, not far from here, at Georgetown University where she was speaking. A simple, straightforward, but very powerful statement. This is what she said, one sentence. She said, I really do believe that this is nursing's time. Simple, straightforward, but very powerful. I may be biased, uh, but as the first nurse ever to serve as the acting deputy secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, I wholeheartedly agree with Diana. This is nursing's time. This is our time. I agree because this profession and the individuals that comprise it have a great deal to offer, particularly now, particularly at this point in time, particularly at this transformative moment in the nation's health care. And this recognition is embedded even in the title of your conference, of this conference, Transforming Health, Driving Policy. It's simple, it's straightforward, and it's so powerful, Transforming Health driving policy. It is so fitting. Because nurses are essential, not just to delivering health care, but also nursing has so much to offer as we work to deliver on meaningful health reform and developing broader health care policy that transforms our health care system and that improves health care and the system, not just for some Americans, but for all Americans. And from my vantage point, it really never has been about the nursing profession engaging in either a focus on, for example, the delivery of clinical services, healthcare services, or focusing on health policy. From my vantage point, for nursing, it has always been about nurses engaging in both arenas. And that is why I am so appreciative of the focus of this organization, of the academy, and the focus of this conference. Advancing the Academy's mission, uh, the, advancing the mission of this organization is critically important. And I thank each and every one of you for the contributions that you've made to advancing the mission of the Academy and that you will make to advancing this mission. This morning, though, I really want to take just the few minutes that I have to talk and then we'll be engaging in a conversation to share with you a little bit about what we're working on from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Three key areas, uh, three key topics. Nursing and the Affordable Care Act. I'll probably spend most of my time there. Uh, the second topic, delivery system reform. And the third topic, our efforts to address a particularly challenging problem right now, and that is opioid misuse. So we could talk, I could talk probably about 20 different topics, but I'm going to address those three. Let me start with the Affordable Care Act and put, at least from my vantage point, my personal perspective, that law in context. So stepping back for just a moment and putting this law in context, and I'll do it this way. If you walked into the building where I work every day, I have the privilege of working, in the main lobby, you would see a quote up on the wall, and it's a quote from Hubert H. Humphrey. That quote from the former vice president etched into the marble says this. It was once said that the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, the handicapped, end quote. Well, I would say that five years ago, this nation took an enormous, test, an enormous step forward to address the moral test that Vice President Humphrey put out there for us that he articulated. And that year, five years ago, there was a significant shift in the health policy landscape. A shift that continues to reverberate today. A shift that at its foundation was designed to improve health and to strengthen the efficiency and the effectiveness of the healthcare delivery system. And with enactment of the Affordable Care Act, a significant set of adjustments began. And I would argue that the Affordable Care Act may well turn out to be one of the greatest social policy reforms in my generation. And as a nurse who, well, yes, I, I agree. And as a nurse who appreciates opinions, because I do, but as a nurse who has wedded just a little bit more toward evidence, 
I would say that the evidence bears out substantial progress across these few short years since its enactment. Without a doubt, there is more to be done. There is no question about that. But substantial progress has been made. Do you know, in 1966, Martin Luther King made an observation that speaks to our work. And he said this, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhuman. Since the Affordable Care Act took effect, we have been working to bridge that chasm of inequality. And through these efforts, now an estimated 17.6 million Americans have gained health care coverage. That is a fact. <laughs> Do you know, in my former life as a nurse educator, I watched year after year the numbers of uninsured in this country ticking upward, year after year. And as a nurse, I had an appreciation then, even as I do now, I had an appreciation then for how devastating that lack of health insurance coverage was for individuals and for families impacted by the, their inability to obtain it. I felt back then, as I watched those numbers, talked about it in classes I was teaching, I felt so powerless and so frustrated because I knew the impact that that had on people. And back then, I would not have envisioned a time when the rate of uninsurance in America would have fallen this fast or dropped further than we have seen it drop in decades. In fact, millions of Americans have gained coverage through the marketplace that was created by the Affordable Care Act. They've gained coverage through pri the private coverage offered by their employers or through their state's Medicaid program, most especially the states that have expanded their Medicaid program. But these, results, but these results, as all of you know, have not come without steady and often pointed questions, a stream of questions. But now, based on the implement implementation of that law, we have some answers. Five years ago, for example, some asked whether the marketplace would deliver a strong consumer experience, and they asked if people would be satisfied with their insurance coverage. We now have an answer. The marketplace offered a product that millions of consumers have now taken advantage of. And studies have shown that marketplace cover, uh, customers, those who were new customers last year in 2014, and those who renewed their plans, in fact, are satisfied. Just a recent study by J.D. Powers of 3,000 health insurance customers found this. They found that those who bought coverage on the marketplace had higher satisfaction ratings than those who bought coverage outside of the marketplace. Five years ago, some wondered whether the courts would strike down the subsidies that millions of Americans who purchased coverage through the marketplace relied on. They got their answer this past June, when the Supreme Court, for the second time, upheld a key provision of the Affordable Care Act. And so as a result, today, citizens in every state know that they can rely on the security and peace of mind that comes with coverage that is high quality and more affordable. Five years ago, there were some who predicted that the law would damage a recovering and a fragile economy at the time. But today, our unemployment rate in, the, in this nation is at its lowest level since April of 2008. And the private sector has actually added over 13 million jobs in over 66 straight months of job growth. So in short, while it's not perfect, while it's not perfect, the law has delivered historic and positive results, impacting the health of individuals and families across the nation, including in the towns and cities where each of you hail from. It has improved access, affordability, and quality of our health care system. It is making sure that millions of Americans have the health coverage that they need when they need health care. And the benefit doesn't accrue just to people who did not historically have insurance coverage. The benefit of the law accrues to all of us. An individual seeking health insurance today who has a chronic health condition, for example, as you know, no longer near, needs to fear lifetime limits being applied to them or exclusions of uh, being able to access health insurance coverage based on pre-existing conditions like asthma, diabetes, or an earlier cancer diagnosis. 
A young person stepping into their first job has the peace of mind that he or she can stay on her parents' or his parents' health care plan until they turn 26 years old. Do you know how many young Americans have taken advantage of that provision alone? About 5.5 million young adults are now able to stay on their parents' health care plans. And as most of us know at that age, young adults view themselves as fairly invincible, and yet we know that unexpected health problems can occur. In addition, new parents can take their children to get vital preventive services like vision screenings, well baby visits, at no out-of-pocket costs. And what did research show us historically? Research showed us that standing between an individual taking advantage of a screening, a health screening or a preventive service, uh, more often than not was the cost of getting that service. And so today, no out-of-pocket costs associated with preventive services, services that keep people healthy. So what's coming next? Well, in just a couple of weeks, we'll begin our third open enrollment, that window when people can enroll in the marketplace, get access to health insurance coverage. And I'll share with you in just a minute a couple of updates on that upcoming milestone. But the marketplace where consumers can compare and purchase affordable insurance coverage is just one piece of the vision for a stronger healthcare delivery system in the future. The foundation of that system includes insurance coverage, but also includes access to quality healthcare services, including, for example, access to primary care, including, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, access to a well-educated healthcare workforce. And we're committed to strengthening those components of this foundation that we pivot from in this next generation of healthcare. One way that we're doing that is by improving access to primary care in those communities across this country that need it the most. And so, for example, in many places, federally qualified health centers offer um, the, uh, that open door to available primary care. Most recently, as a matter of fact, just a month ago, September 15th, we awarded nearly $500 million in Affordable Care Act funding to continue to strengthen our community health centers across the nation. These funds are designed to expand comprehensive quality health care. What difference will they make? Well, this is the difference that that investment makes. It allows the addition of 1.4 million more Americans to be able to access primary care, preventive health care services through that health care infrastructure. And since the Affordable Care Act passed, because of its focus on expanding access to primary care, the number of people who are able to get care through health centers as a result of the ACA has increased to uh, has increased by 7.4 million Americans. So the, Amer the Affordable Care Act expands access to insurance coverage, but it also goes upstream and expands access to what every nurse values, and that's access to keeping people healthy in the first place and mitigating chronic conditions. That's access to primary care. And these new funds, for example, the $500 million that I mentioned expands, insur expands insurance coverage places where people can go. Uh, uh, ex for example, expands availability of dental health services, treatment for individuals suffering from substance abuse uh, disorders, funds that allow health centers to hire more primary care providers, including behavioral health uh, providers, and also makes available people who are able to help individuals walking through those doors to learn about how to use their new health insurance coverage. Over the past five years, you may not be aware of this, but as we've used the Affordable Care Act resources to build out our nation's primary care infrastructure, we have in the process across those health centers added positions to hire an additional, and so we have hired an additional through, through those health centers, 5,800 nurses. A new infrastructure expanded relying on nurse practitioners, registered nurses, nurse midwives, and so on. And the administration, as an aside, is continuing to support nursing education. In fact, just this week, the HHS division that I used to lead, HRSA, announced awards of approximately $70 million in scholarship and loan repayment through the Nurse Corps program. These are awards that financially help nurses who fulfill their service obligations by working where we need them most, in cities as well as in rural communities. We also want to ensure that every nurse coming into our new re-engineered healthcare delivery system has the tools and support they need to be as effective as possible. 
So with these new Affordable Care Act opportunities, as well as the extension of existing federal programs, over the past six years, do you know that through HHS, we have awarded nearly $1.7 billion to educate new nurses, to improve nursing education, and to connect nurses to more communities that need them the most. So a significant investment, and, and that investment in education and training is essential because what we focus on going forward is different than what we've focused on historically. We are in healthcare delivery, we think, at the cusp of fairly radical changes. For example, as you've probably started to see by mapping the human genome, we've set our eyes on a new frontier of personalized, patient-centered research, or what you're, you're hearing termed precision medicine. This type of disease prevention and treatment takes into account individuals' differences in people's genes, individuals' differences in their environments, individuals' differences in their lifestyles. And it means that the care provided will be more targeted. It will be, we hope, more effective. And we're fairly certain it will likely be more complex. So the promise of precision medicine is to help healthcare systems and providers deliver more tailored treatment at the right time to the right person. And we need to ensure that our healthcare providers, including nurses around the country, have the tools and the support that they need as we embark on this new era in healthcare. We're also investing in new innovations that can improve the way we deliver care. Programs like the Healthcare Innovation Awards in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. That's part of our commitment too fueled by the Affordable Care Act to support new, most compelling ideas. So there are a lot of provisions of the law that are helping us to set a new course for a better health care system and better health, then, for Americans, from helping to ensure access by supporting primary care to ensuring access through a strong nursing workforce and, of course, by bringing more Americans into our health care system through expanded health insurance coverage. And the key to accessing health insurance coverage is the key to affordability. Fortunately, for those 17.6 million people and many more who had coverage before them, the law's subsidies make coverage more affordable than ever. Last year, nearly four out of every five marketplace consumers had access to a plan for less than $100 per month after tax credits. But as a nation, we have more work to do. There are still more Americans who need health insurance coverage. As I mentioned earlier, the third open enrollment period starts November 1st. So what do we need to know about the people who live in your cities, in your neighborhoods, who still need coverage? Well, we know a few things about them. We know that our target population, that is those people in the, this nation who are still uninsured, are going to be even harder to reach this time around in this open enrollment. There are reasons for that, a couple of good reasons and then some that make this ch even more challenging. Good reasons, well, we have an improving economy and that means that more people are getting coverage through their employers, so that's good. And we also, good news, know that we've reduced the percentage already of individuals without health insurance. So those are signs of progress. But it also means that there are fewer potential marketplace customers, about 10.5 million potential customers out there who could benefit by coming to the marketplace. And based on our most recent analysis, do you know who those people are? Some of the characteristics? There are young invincibles. They're folks who are between the ages of 18 and 34 years old, who are in that 10.5 million, pretty substantial number in that 10.5 million, who qualify for marketplace plans but have not yet taken advantage of them. Also, what do we know about them? Many of them are from underserved communities. Almost 40% of the uninsured who qualify for purchasing marketplace plans live between about 139 and 250% of the poverty level. More than a third of the folks who qualify for insurance coverage through the marketplace are people of color. 19% are Hispanic, 14% are African American, and about 2% are Asian. Almost 60% of the uninsured who qualify don't fully understand, for example, how tax credits work, or they don't even know that tax credits are available to help make that insurance coverage affordable. And many of these individuals are very concerned about trying to fit health insurance premiums into their families' budgets. In fact, do you know this? About half of the people who are uninsured and could qualify have less than $100 in savings. 
So those are some of the characteristics of the people we still need to reach. And to reach this population, our outreach efforts will rely a great deal on nurses and other health care providers. And to that end, I had the pleasure of meeting with the, uh, some of the board members of the academy earlier this week, and I thank them publicly now uh, for making that effort uh, to, come in, to come to the Humphrey Building and talk with myself and a few of my colleagues. And a couple of days after I met with them, I met with representatives of social work organizations, physician organizations, healthcare uh, hospital, uh, hospital organizations, uh, all uh, by way of building and strengthening partnerships because we know we need everyone's assistance at the local community level to help individuals who are right now standing on the outside of health insurance coverage to get health insurance coverage and to know that that, care, that coverage is available. As trusted members of communities, your voice is about as important as it can be in helping to advance this message. So we invite your assistance. We look forward to your assistance in helping to spread this word. And of course, in the process to help you, we'll help by providing you with tools to make those interactions seamless and to make your information you're providing salient. We've got resources, tools, pocket cards, et cetera, that we'll make available to you. Lots of technical support documents that are already available, and more will be added to one particular website that's easily accessible, and that is marketplace.cms.gov. Bottom line, this work cannot be done from Washington. It has to be done in partnership at the local level, and your help is absolutely essential to connect those 10.5 million people with the coverage that they need. So the upcoming enrollment period, as I said, begins November 1, runs to the end of January, but simultaneously, even as we do that work, we are also at HHS working hard to transform our system in other ways, transform our healthcare system in ways that work for the American people. And that means, in terms of delivery system reform, that second topic, I'll be much briefer about this one and the next, that means that we focus on a healthcare system that delivers better care that spends our dollars more wisely, and a healthcare delivery system that really does put the patient at the center of their care to keep them healthy. Those three areas that I just mentioned are at the heart of HHS's delivery system reform efforts, and we're engaging that focus with stakeholder organizations from across the country, including with nursing organizations. And with them, we have a plan to meet and, uh, and deploy that delivery system reform. First, we need to change, let me say a word about each of the three areas. First, we need to change the way that we pay providers. So let's just start there. We need to change the way that we pay, pay providers. And so we're working on that. We know that we need to incentivize quality of care, not quantity of care. Smarter payments then, driving towards smarter payments that are oriented toward better health outcomes, tying payment to health outcomes, and helping to cut down on inefficiencies. In the past few years, we have set very ambitious goals. For the first time, I might add, in the Medicare and Medicaid programs, we have moved and we are continuing to move toward payment models where providers are paid for how well they provide care, not how much care they provide to patients. Secondly, we want to better organize and use health information. And we have a lot of effort underway in that area. Through the use of electronic health records and other health data, we know that providers can talk to each other more easily and can access and make more informed decisions when they have information at their fingertips right at the point of care. And when we give consumers access to their records, they can be more active participants in their care. But you know what? Pushing information out there isn't enough. Providing information isn't enough. Using that information to provide better care is a whole different and additional challenge. And it's one where the nursing profession, I would suggest, has really already charted a course in this area. Not just pr the production of information, but the application of information. In fact, the woman who laid the foundation for modern nursing built that right into the, the foundation of our profession. She built a consistent and sharp focus on not just delivering care, but a focus and an expectation that nurses work to improve the care that is delivered. I'll give you just one example. In 1871, Florence Nightingale wrote of, a, of one of the studies, one of many studies she, she conducted, of mortality rates for women in childbirth. She discovered at that time much to the shock, by the way, of the medical world, that the death rates 
of what were then called lying in hospitals, the hospitals where, nurse, where, where patients, mothers, would go to deliver babies, the death rates of lying in hospitals far exceeded the death rates of women getting, giving birth at home. While the label, hospital acquired infections, hadn't been invented yet, that's exactly what Florence Nightingale was focused on. That was the problem that she was working on. And it's an idea that, of course, we now full-throated embrace and work toward the improvement of healthcare delivery. And, of course, I would say that if she wasn't the founder, she was certainly a major contributor to that new and very important research field, health services research. At HHS, I would say we're, we've worked and we're working to take up Nightingale's legacy. And that's why, for example, we've been working on efforts like Partnership for Patients, a partnership with healthcare providers from across the country to reduce healthcare acquired infections. And we've estimated that between 2010 and 2013, our data now tell us that this initiative has collectively saved about 50,000 patients' lives and approximately $12 billion in healthcare costs. That is delivery system reform. That is what we're talking about. At HHS, we are committed to working across, with partners across sectors and around the nation, including nurses, of course, to deliver better health care to all Americans. And that means moving away, further away from a system where we treat the parts of a person to a system where we treat patients as, in, as a, a, the patient's whole health at the center of care. All of which, of course, sounds like nursing, doesn't it? And that's why I am particularly thrilled that the American Academy of Nursing has joined the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network, part of this major delivery system reform effort. Your leadership, this organization's leadership and commitment will help us to drive further ideas and innovations to launch toward this next generation of a delivery system in this country. Last area I wanted to just mention and shift your attention to, third and last, and that is the opioid epidemic. I know that you're aware of the epidemic of opioid use disorders. It is, I'm here to tell you, a major priority for us as well. We are extremely concerned about the deaths from opioid overdoses that we are seeing. You probably are aware that, dr that drug overdose deaths have increased five-fold in the United States since about 1980. And did you know that now deaths from drug overdose are the leading cause of injury, associated deaths in our country? Today, these deaths are more deadly, impacting more people than deaths that, uh, from car crashes, for example. As I'm sure you know, there is a groundswell of concern across the country and support for action to end this epidemic. We saw some of that groundswell right here in Washington, D.C. just a few weeks ago when HHS brought representatives from every one of your states here to Washington to begin to share ideas and set regional strategies for fighting this epidemic. Our first step to, revi to reversing the epidemic is to help people get greater access to treatment that can help them recover. Our focus is to expand access to and use of evidence-based medication-assisted treatment. That is a comprehensive way to address the needs of individuals that combines the use of medication with counseling and behavioral therapies to treat substance use disorders. Studies consistently show that medication-assisted treatment of opioid use disorders is the most effective treatment option. But do you know, this is one of the most significantly underutilized approaches to this health problem. That's why we recently engaged, or we recently announced that HHS will be engaging in rulemaking related to the prescription of certain drugs approved by the FDA for treatment of opioid dependence. Second, we need to work with our healthcare professionals to make sure that they have the tools and education to make informed prescribing and to deliver care when it comes to uh, the prescription and use of opioid pain deliver, uh, relievers. And on that front, right now, CDC is drafting suggested guidelines for prescribers to improve opioid prescribing for chronic pain. Finally, prescription opioid and heroin overdoses are a very real threat from our smallest rural communities to our large cities. And that is why we need to ensure that naloxone, a drug that rapidly reverses an opioid overdose, is readily and quickly available to save lives. The HHS division that I used to lead, HRSA, 
uh, recently announced $1.8 million in grants, for example, to rural communities that will expand the reach of this essential drug. And what we hope this means is that people, in this case in rural communities, including nurses, who might witness or respond to overdoses, will have what is a life-saving medication at their fingertips. The epidemic of opioids in this country is incredibly complex. It is a widespread problem, and it's one that requires our unified attention. We have found in our meetings and our discussions and the recent convening of leaders from across the nation that our country is united to do just this. And on this front, there is clearly more that we must collectively do. Well, I want to end my formal remarks by just saying, expressing again my heartfelt appreciation for everything that each of you does on behalf of the nation's health. You know, I've had the privilege to know many of you or to know of you. Even as I ask you to consider, I, I recognize the great work that all of you have done uh, in your own right, even as I'm asking of you to do more, to do more to advance access to insurance coverage, to do more to reform our healthcare delivery system, to do more to, uh, to mitigate uh, 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 the scourge of major healthcare problems we're dealing with in this country today. I want you to know that I view it as an, an incredible privilege to know many of you, and just as I was inspired by nurses' commitment and expertise and depth of care when I worked in a small rural hospital in my hometown in North Dakota at age 16 as a nurse's aide, just as I was inspired then to take up that mantle of nursing because of what I witnessed in those nurses, the difference that they made in people's lives, so too I have been inspired by members of this academy, by members of my profession who give so much to so many through their service delivery, through their important research, through their public policy work, through their administration and education, and through a plethora of other ways. And I can say that the center of gravity for me has always been, and it continues to be, the privilege of being a nurse first. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Fabulous. Madam Deputy Secretary. Acting. There's a Acting. I knew she'd process. say that. I knew she said that, but I didn't want to say it. It's the only time I'd ever collect Eileen, or correct Eileen, trust me. <laughs> well, the other day, as, as uh, Mary mentioned, we were in uh, the Deputy Act, Acting Deputy Secretary's conference room as your board to discuss the, some of the topics that she just mentioned, but to learn how the Academy in Nursing could be further engaged. And I just have to reflect on that moment a bit. Um, you know, you are referred to as Madam Deputy Secretary by your staff, and we called you Mary. Thank you. And I'm trying to get them to do the same thing, actually, yes. <laughs> you can do the same thing. Well, the, the reason I bring that up is that I had been in those meeting rooms before in different fellowships and different activities, and the feeling of engagement, the feeling of being with one's peer, the feeling of being within one's knowing discipline was profound for me um, and in the sense that here's a group working on, on things that are very important to the nation and which we all agree on. So I just want to thank you for that. Pleasure. We've spent a lot of time at this meeting beginning with um, messages about our strategic goals, which are social determinants of health, the triple aim, talking about RWJ's culture of health and talking about global payment and then ending with your action items, which of course are the implementation. So I wanted to take a minute and I encourage others to put their questions out as we've done earlier in meetings uh, on index cards and pass them to the Jonas scholars and then we'll have time for some questions. But I want you to reflect for a minute um, our aspirations for this group for everyone to be engaged in further steps in their leadership and how, what thoughts you had about your own career, a few pearls to, to add to the wonderful pearls we've already had at this meeting. Um, so, and so you're asking Eileen the difference. You came from North Dakota and now you're in the She says Deputy there's a tone Secretary. there. She said that 
you know, the, the work with uh, Senator Daschle. Sure, or Conrad and Bertie. So, right. so, um, so uh, um, I'd like to think that I came off as sort of the uh, Harvard equivalent of the Northern Plains, we'll say. <laughs> Actually, Eileen makes a really important point, and that is that, um, uh, that, that I think that people uh, un can, under the right circumstances and with a little bit of motivation, uh, can come from anywhere. And uh, um, uh, from a middle class uh, background in a town that virtually no one outside of North Dakota would have ever heard, heard of. Uh, and um, uh, over the course of time, be, uh, you know, move through a process, a career process, uh, that, that um, uh, takes you right here to the nation's capital. And so I think that that in itself is an important point to make, that, that um, barriers are porous. Barriers don't prevent nurses from achieving really anything in my mind. I certainly was not intimidated. Uh, maybe that was because I had six older brothers and they sort of get to kind of you know, beat your way through, uh, um, either to the table or out the door or wherever you were going. So maybe I sort of learned that first and foremost uh, in my own family upbringing. But I think there's a lesson there, and that is that that um, there is there are nothing holds any of us back. And I would suggest that the, my degree in nursing, and I've been asked many times, what difference did it make? Do you wish you would have done something else? Uh, uh, my degree in nursing actually helped to advance me uh, really every step of the way, in no small part because of what I learned in that degree that was applicable not just at the bedside, but it's as applicable in the work that I do right today. And I could, I could give you examples of that if you were interested. But the point is that uh, uh, nursing as a stepping stone uh, was just fundamentally important because of the knowledge and skills and also the uh, relationships uh, that I was able to uh, build over time. So, so one point is to have, it, have the mindset, I would say, that, that armed with this professional background, one can do anything if one wishes to, uh, to advance the uh, uh, health care. If it's caring for six people, uh, patients in a hospital, or it is uh, uh, impacting care for six million people or something very different. So, so uh, there are no boundaries that are, are impermeable uh, from my vantage point. And that's pretty much been my attitude from the very beginning. I would also say that it's a lot about tenacity. It's a lot about uh, uh, pushing hard and long uh, uh, to um, advance uh, one's agenda, not to advance one, and I would say not even to advance one's profession but to advance one's agenda. And my agenda from day one, I referenced the nurses that I watched when I was 16 years old, a long time ago, and I was starstruck. I was starstruck by the difference that they made every hour of every day to the people for whom they cared. That has stayed with me all the way through, and that has become my agenda to make a difference. So it's not even about nursing, it's about using nursing to do what I think nursing was designed to do, and that is to improve the health and well-being of the people in our, in our neighborhoods, communities, and our country, and for some of us in this room, uh, internationally as well. So it's about attitude, it's about armed with the right or a good degree that allows you to advance, and it's also about, uh, I think, building relationships. Uh, staying in touch, not just within the nursing profession, but more broadly, what's going on across healthcare. And when I worked on Capitol Hill, I didn't have the privilege of just talking about nursing in any given day, although I talked about it a great deal. I had to really be thinking more broadly about many, many facets of healthcare. So it's about also extending the boundaries of what we're focused on, paying attention to, and, uh, and attempting to reform, if you will. And so for some of the folks in the room who might be a little bit younger on the, on the early side of their career, I would suggest that to you as well. Sharp focus on nursing, but with an eye toward everything else, if you will, that's going on in healthcare, and becoming part of that, informing and influencing part of that. So it's attitude, focus, uh, building relationships, and, um, and having a no-holds-barred uh, uh, um, orientation to the work that you do, along with that fundamental underlying motivation that we're here, that what we're all about is to help people at the end of the day in terms of their health. Thanks. So. Thanks. So, in helping people um, for their health, one of the highlights um, that you mentioned is the uh, reduction in people who are no longer uninsured. Mm -hmm. and 
um, you gave us a report showing that there's been a reduction in people who are struggling with those payments from 41% to 35% of adults with, um, who now have access who no longer are struggling with their bills. But I was struck with, well, it's from 41 to 35%, but I think we still wanna get it down lower than 35% for people who are struggling to pay medical bills. And um, what about um, the struggle that people have in states that don't have Medicaid expansion? How can the academy and nurses in this room, because this has been one of the, um, following the Supreme Court earlier decision, has been one of the, the difficulties. Um, so talk a little bit about what we can do in those states that, that don't have this uh, complete collaboration yet. So I would say a couple of things. One. Um, uh, the, the lack of Medicaid expansion in some states, I think, creates for us a very uneven playing field in terms of individuals being able to access health care and either become healthy or stay healthy. So it's an uneven playing field for those folks who otherwise, be just by virtue of the borders of where they live, the state in which they live, do or do not uh, have access to health care services that would be available to them through the expansion of Medicaid. That, from where I sit, is a, is a very uneven playing field dictated largely by geography, just by virtue of where you live. So, the, um, uh, uh, and I would say, say something else, that has an impact on individuals, in other words, and it also has an impact in many respects on the economic health of the healthcare infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So be mindful of that, that when people come through the door of a hospital with insurance coverage, Medicaid, private pay, uh, Medicare, when they come through the door with health insurance coverage versus coming through the door with no insurance coverage at all. Uh, the uncompensated care that that hospital, for example, uh, is responsible for assuming when patients uh, come who are not insured has an economic impact on the economic health of that infrastructure. So lack of Medicaid expansion impacts families and individuals and it also impacts, I would suggest, the health of, uh, of much of uh, uh, um, healthcare infrastructure in those states that have not expanded healthcare. So we're, we are working uh, really hard with um, uh, governors that are interested in pursuing, uh, uh, with some flexibilities where we have them in the law, uh, Medicaid expansion, and we'll continue to engage that work. And clearly, this is work that, and, and uh, conversation uh, that nurses can have in their local uh, communities and, and within their states. And, uh, and hopefully you, you would know whether or not you're in a state that has expanded Medicaid or hasn't, uh, but if you're in states that haven't, uh, your voices probably matter greatly there. Uh, and, um, and as I said, this, is, this impacts of it in such a significant way on both fronts, both the health of the, the places where you seek your own health care and as well as the individuals who live in your communities. So, uh, so it's a, an area for nurses to pay attention to and an area where nurses um, uh, may well be able to engage in their local communities uh, on, uh, on con in conversation about uh, Medicaid expansion. So along those lines, we have some questions from the audience too about, um, about what, how can we engage with people at the community level who are really struggling with, why should I spend you know, 50, 100, 200, or whatever it might be. So I would think that nurses need to engage with the communities, but should we be um, addressing the governor's office directly, and how could that be really helpful in the Medicaid expansion states? Um, uh, I would you say, you know, n n nursing and nursing organizations and individual nurses are a force for good in my mind. And so conversations that you engage about healthcare, healthcare reform, uh, the Affordable Care Act at large, uh, trying to get more people uh, insured, expanding Medicaid, et cetera. Nurses have a lot of different touch points where they can engage those conversations. Uh, and and um, I, I, I'm, I don't think you need to hear from me about where you can use those voices. I think that probably nurses are fairly familiar with uh, uh, where they can engage these conversations. It's in community uh, meeting rooms. It's in uh, um, waiting rooms. It's in uh, professional organization, in, in the meetings of professional organizations. It's uh, talking about healthcare challenges uh, that, that aren't met but that could be met. Uh, uh, with, with, all, with folks of all different persuasions. Uh, you mentioned governor's offices, and I would say even with faith leaders. 
with uh, uh, ministers and, uh, uh, and individuals even from the faith community. This is a shared agenda. It's a conversation. It's not just for nursing. It's, all, it's, it's a shared agenda for many different stakeholders. And so I think we have natural partners in this conversation uh, uh, if we seek them out. So thank you. So I have a couple of questions that I've heard from people. And you can imagine um, we're nurses. So, and, and you think about it in this way as well getting right down to implementation. Mm -hmm. And some implementation about devices, electronic health record. Um, we note that um, including um, uh, LGBTQ in, in the identification and health records that meet the needs of that group. Doing other things related to the electronic health records. Can you speak to something that um, is on the top tier? Because nurses are have their fingers in the electronic electronic health record, and we have you, have you ever served campaign, we want to see that happen. People see the electronic health record as an instrument to really engage, um, but yet we still have variation in what records are being used. So speak to where, where you're going with this. Yeah, so I could say just a couple of things really about that, and, and, um, and I don't, I, I am, it is not an area that I'm working in very explicitly, so, um, uh, so just a couple of points probably worth, worth making. One, through the Affordable Care Act, you're probably aware we've made incredible investments in uh, helping to build out uh, electronic health infrastructure and using uh, payment to drive uh, um, uh, the acquisition of, of electronic health records. So you see that, you know, again, lots of people talk about the, the um, coverage of the uninsured as the ACA, and yet there are all these other parts of the Affordable Care Act uh, that don't get, acquire uh, quite the same visibility. And the push on electronic health records has been part of that. Uh, so for example, that community health centers that I was talking about earlier, there's been very significant financial investment in, in helping them to acquire, to move from paper pencil to electronic health records. Interoperability is a huge issue for us right now. That's an area that we're spending a lot of time. Uh, uh, information sharing with uh, electronic health records at the core is one of the major components of our delivery system reform initiative writ large. So you see it in the Affordable Care Act on the funding side earlier, and you're seeing it continue to pull forward through meaningful use, et cetera, uh, uh, through delivery system reform. So big picture, this is front and center as an area of focus for us, uh, with much of the aim being uh, to both uh, move information to consumers so that they can make informed choices about uh, better meeting their health care needs, as well as moving meaningful information directly, as I mentioned in my remarks, to the point of care. So wherever that point of care may be, a home health visit, uh, a clinician's office, and so on. Uh, so it is a means to an end, not an end in itself, but one that we think is, is inextricably tied to ensuring access to high quality care for providers but also for patients, for, for populations. Great. So I think we're encouraging people now to go to microphones um, for another few minutes. Can um, you could see we them have really? the, well, we put the lights up a little bit, and then we'll see if people want to get engaged in a conversation. And then after that, I have one final question for you. That'll be a fun question. So over here. Hi, I'm Kay Ball, uh, Otterbein University in Westerville, Ohio. Thank you, Mary. We're so proud that you're in our troops. But uh, the question I have is about the ACA, mm -hmm. and I agree that it's one of the most powerful initiatives that have ever been passed. My question is, with the presidential campaign going on and our elections coming up, all the Republicans say they want to repeal Obamacare, repeal the ACA. Is there a section of the ACA, because it's so complex, that they are targeting? How can we be proactive and be prepared to even address when we hear them say things like this? Um, so I'm here in my official capacity, and I won't speak to politics as a result. Um, uh, but th th this is what I will say: that that um, thank you for the question. The, um, uh, th this administration, this president, and this and Secretary Burwell, are very committed to changes that will advance affordability quality, accessibility. So the president himself has said on more than one occasion his interest and willingness to work to uh, advance improvements uh, in the law, as long as they don't compromise those areas that I just mentioned. That is the affordability, its accessibility, or, or quality. So there is, uh, from this administration, and that's what, I, that's what I'm speaking from, 
this administration a commitment and a willingness uh, to, ad to advance that work in that area, uh, that is improvements, uh, where, um, uh, where those uh, um, uh, particular um, focal areas are not adversely impacted. And that's probably as much as I would say in response to that uh, okay. question and comment, but thank you for it. Thank you. Let's mm -hmm. go over here. Hi, um, my name is Lucy Bradley Springer. I'm from Denver, Colorado, and I do HIV work. So I was very excited to hear that you mentioned um, injection drug use as part of your three top areas. But I was surprised that as part of the way to deal with that, you did not mention needle and syringe exchange, which has been shown internationally as well in this, as in this country to be an effective means to decrease um, disease transmission during injection drug use, but even more importantly, it brings people into places where they can get education and counseling. And I'm wondering where the country is on this very important public health intervention. You know, I think I know the answer to that question in terms of what our statutes allow us to do, but because I don't, I, I'm, I'm not 100% certain, I don't want to, uh, to say what I think is the answer to that question. Maisha, do you happen to, to ha go ahead, I'm sorry? It's statutory. Right, right, that's what I thought was, well, go ahead, if, if you're more, a little bit <laughs> more familiar with it than I am. See, I can't even <laughs> see her. <laughs> The, limita the, the limitation is statutory, it's, it's right? Statutory. Yes, yes. So, so, um, uh, so the, there is a, the, the, our federal laws uh, um, prevent us, correct me if I'm wrong, Maisha, as I'm saying this, our federal laws, I believe, uh, uh, prohibit us currently from uh, um, uh, funding needle exchange programs. Am I correct on that? I believe yeah. so. Okay. So, yeah. so, so it's statutory is the point. Congress could change that law. Okay. So um, for those of us who care about that, it's a matter of um, educating Congress. No? Well, it's, it's a matter of presenting evidence. So here at the Academy, through um, expert panels, healthy behaviors, through um, the expert panel on psych mental health, this is a way to bring that to the forum. So I think that's, that's a good point. It's evidence-based. Um, certainly there's a lot of research in that area. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, did you want to add in, yeah. Maisha? I, I, Excuse me, Maish Gaston is one of my colleagues from HHS. She's terrific. And she's, by the way, the person who outreaches with external agencies, which is why she's here on a Saturday morning leaving her one-year-old and her four-year-old at home. She's terrific. Thank you, Mary. I, I just wanted to add to that that uh, there has been some success at the state level in getting syringe exchange passed. Mm -hmm. Many of you may have heard about the uh, out the incident in Indiana, yeah. uh, and when the outbreak happened, there was movement at the state we'll level to allow for syringe exchange. So there are some promising models that are happening at the state level. So the, your advocacy at the local level could also be helpful in that area. Thank you. Final, a final question, which in some ways I think is rhetorical, but came from the audience. But Mary, when will you run for president of the United States? <laughs> <laughs> Could I? <laughs> I th thank you so much. I have enough of a challenge handling the job I have right now. Um, and I would also have to say, it's just my personal, personal opinion. I love the president I'm working for right now, yeah, too. Thank fabulous. you very much. Thank, thank you thank very you. much. So I'm asking people to just hold on for a minute. Uh, Mary said she could stay a few minutes afterwards, right, and see some of you who I know want to, want to say hello to her. I, I want to emphasize that she's acting, and we can do something about that. So please take out your calendar on your cell phone or take your pen on your notepad, and Monday morning contact your U.S. Senator and say you need to confirm Mary Wakefield as Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Service. And those of you who live in states where your U.S. Senator is on the Senate Judiciary Committee, like Iowa and Texas and Arizona and some others, that's very important. Make sure you contact that person. Mary, you are phenomenal. Thank you so much. May I just say one question yes. about public correction about Mary? You can correct me. Secretary position is actually the Senate Finance Committee. Oh, so, thank FYI. you. Thank Just you. FYI. Thank you. That's Don't all I'm anywhere. saying, finance. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Eileen for Mary for the perfect closing to today's program.